good morning yeah yeah so um good morning to those of you who are online as well uh, we will begin our class with old testament survey that's the topic that we would be covering this semester um so uh, we would look very briefly at each of the old testament books try to see what are the main highlights in each book um what are the main events who are the main characters so we would not really be doing a study you know uh, chapter by chapter of these books uh, that would take too much time so all we are actually doing uh, in the old testament survey is that we are making an an overview you know just a very brief survey of what this um, uh, old testament involves what each um, book in the old testament focuses on emphasizes uh, upon and things like that uh, so before we actually be, um, get into the topic um, just to give you an idea regarding the assessments uh, so um, all of the assessments would be done online okay you would not have any exam which is hand written all of the assessments will be on google classroom so um, those of you who are here physically uh i'm assuming that you know you would be given um access to the google classroom you'll have your own ids so when you are doing the exam you would log in to google classroom and you would be doing the exam on google classroom so there would be basically two assessments um the first would be the midterm assessment which takes place halfway through the course uh so it would be a multiple choice uh, paper you would have 50 questions and you would have to tick the correct answer for each of the questions because it's a multiple choice uh, format uh, so in the same way at the very end of the um, course you would also have the final assessment which would be for another 50 marks so both the midterm and the final assessments uh, will be multiple choice format so it's not a written paper um, so the requirements are rather easy uh you know you will not have any difficulty with it uh so this applies to the people who are you know uh, joining us on google classroom and it also applies to us who are sitting over here okay so um this one question here from someone uh asking about assessments 1 and 2 uh with the submission date being 11th august i do not know anything about that uh, because we uh, today is actually day 1 of our course uh, so um i'll ask the it team whether you know it means anything uh, but right now i do not have an answer for you i'm not sure what uh, that particular uh, notification is about so uh, if i get to know about it i will let you know all right uh, yeah so yes you know if you have any questions those of you who are online you can just post it here in the chat and i will keep an eye on the chat so that you know your questions uh, also can be answered um so those of us who are here uh, even as i am speaking even as i am delivering the lecture uh, if you have any doubts just put up your hand right away do not wait until the end of the class uh, so as we are talking about some particular topic if you have a doubt or a question please raise your hand and we can address the question right then and there okay so um, now those of you who are online if you um don't have a question when the class is going on but you would like to ask something later you can actually post your questions on the stream page as well and then i can type out an answer for you and give it to you okay so that's also possible uh, for those of you who are accessing through the google classroom uh, so those are just some initial um, instructions uh, those of us who are in the class the general rule is that please do not put your head down on the desk in case you are not well you are you are free to go upstairs and you know put your head down you know in the um, in the common area over there uh, but do not do that in the class so yes there will be times when you are unwell and when that happens you are free to leave the class you can go upstairs and you know you can rest but in the class nobody should put their head down on the desk simply because that's a very infectious uh, um, action it infects all the others and everyone else also feels like doing that okay, so just to avoid that 
please do not do that. Okay, so uh, um, Old Testament survey is actually a good subject. But sometimes, you know, um, uh, in case you do not like that, that particular book of the Old Testament, you may find it a bit tedious. So in such cases, even there's a temptation to, you know, tune out, resist the temptation, uh, because there's something that we can gain from every one of the Old Testament books, because they are all inspired scripture, which the Holy Spirit has inspired. Okay, so um, today is just the introduction. So we will not get into Genesis today. That would take place next Monday, uh, simply because on Thursday we would be having Independence Day, and that's a government holiday. So um, you know um, we will not be having a class on Thursday. So Genesis will only be covered on Monday. Um, but today we will have an introduction. We'll just kind of briefly look at the Old Testament, the original Hebrew Old Testament, um, and um, Consider a few details regarding that. And then next class onwards, you know, we will um, get into each of the Old Testament uh, books. So um, to start off, maybe we can begin by reading a scripture. Now, uh, those of you who are online, if you would like to, you know, you can unmute and read out the verse which I'm asking for. Or if someone else in the class here uh, would like to read out, that also is fine. Uh, so it's, you know, first come, first serve basis. Whoever starts speaking out first gets to read it. Um, so uh, the introductory verse that I would like us to begin our Old Testament study with is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. In fact, some of us know this, you know, by heart. Uh, so uh, if someone could turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verses 15 to 17, uh, if someone can read it aloud for us, please. Now, as most of us are familiar, this particular passage is talking about how scriptures are beneficial and useful to us. I mean, when you look over here, what are the scriptures that they are talking about, you know, here in this particular letter? Uh, Paul is writing this letter to Tim Timothy, and he's talking about the value of the scriptures. At that point of time, the New Testament has not yet been uh, finalized. You know, all the letters have not yet been written out. They have not been compiled into what we call the New Testament. So in fact, the, when, it's, when it says over here that all of the scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, it's not even talking about the New Testament. It's referring to the Old Testament because that was the scriptures which were available at that point of time. So here... Paul refers to the Old Testament scriptures which have already been made available to the people. And he says, these scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Because the whole Old Testament is pointing towards Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's preparing the way uh, for the people to receive Jesus Christ. So he goes on to say that this scripture, it is God-breathed. And it is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting. And if anyone meditates upon these Old Testament scriptures, it says that person will become thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, of course, we have the added advantage of also having the New Testament you know, in our Bibles. But back then, when the people had only the Old Testament with them, even that Old Testament is enough to make you thoroughly equipped for every good work which God wants you to do. So that is the advantage uh, that we have of these God-inspired, God-breathed scriptures. And if you look, this particular you know, wording is being written by Paul to Timothy. And Timothy had a Jewish parent 
but he also had a Gentile parent. So these Old Testament scriptures were not just written for the Jewish people. It was meant for all cultures. It was meant for people belonging to all nationalities. So this Old Testament scripture makes us wise for salvation. Um, and it, this is not made available only to the Jewish people, but even to the Greeks, even to the people of all the other cultures. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, get, we see in um, Acts chapter 16, that's basically where it tells us that uh, Timothy had a Greek father, uh, but his uh, mother was Jewish and she brings him up in the scriptures. And, uh, you know, he from infancy, from childhood, he learns these scriptures and he becomes well versed in them. So when we consider the Old Testament, now, which is the language in which it was written? I mean, if any of you are familiar with that, the which language was the Old Testament originally first written in? You know, when Moses wrote certain portions, uh, when uh, Joshua wrote certain portions, which language did they use to write this Old Testament scripture? Exactly. So that was the mother tongue of those people. So they wrote it in their language, in the language known to them. But in spite of that, there are some portions, three portions actually in the Old Testament, which are not written in the Hebrew language. They are written in another language called Aramaic. Aramaic is quite similar to Hebrew, um, but there are some slight differences. So certain portions were written in the Aramaic language. Uh, let me just actually read out that to you. So in case you're taking notes, you know, you can just jot that, uh, jot that down. Um, in Genesis 31, 47, you have one place being named in the Aramaic language. Okay, so that's not very important, not very significant. It's just that instead of using the um, Hebrew name for the place, Laban gives it, uh, calls it by its Aramaic name. Uh, but the other three passages where Aramaic is used, it is significant. The second place where you see Aramaic being used uh, in the Old Testament, that would be in Ezra chapter 4, um, all the way up to Ezra chapter 6. Ezra 4, 18, up to chapter 6, verse 18. That entire chunk is recorded in the Aramaic language, not in the Hebrew language. And that is because that particular portion is talking about how, you know, uh, God has brought the people back from exile. He has brought them back to the land of Jerusalem. And now the people are trying to rebuild the temple which had been destroyed, uh, which had been destroyed by the Babylonians. So while when the rebuilding is going on, you have an official decree being given by the Persian king saying that the construction work of the temple should be stopped. So the, the letter which he, issue, he issues, that is written in the Aramaic language. And then all the politics which takes place at that time, when, when the, when the uh, king puts a stop to the work that is going on. So that entire passage, right up to the time when another letter is issued and the construction work starts again, that entire portion is written in the Aramaic language. Why did God inspire, um, you know, Ezra, the writer, to record those things in the Aramaic language and not in the Hebrew language? It's because a great work was being done. You see, the Babylonians had destroyed the earlier temple, and now God had brought his people back just as he promised. And now there's a new work of reconstruction going on. And there's a lot of opposition which the people are facing. And in the middle of those difficult circumstances, God is making a way for them. And it's as though God wants all the nations, you know, which were more familiar with Aramaic than with Hebrew, he wanted all these Aramaic speaking nations also to be able to read those portions and understand that this is a living God for whom there are no limitations. All kinds of opposition may come from even the most powerful people. The kings and the governors may be against the people of God. But when God is at work, he will make a way. 
what he wishes to achieve shall take place. So this particular portion, all the way from Ezra 4.18 up to 6.18, it's recorded in the Aramaic language so that even Aramaic speaking people uh, of the other nations can read it and recognize how powerful and sovereign the living God of the Israelites is. The next portion is equally significant. That would be in your Daniel chapter 2 verse 4 all the way up to Daniel chapter 7 verse 28. So from Daniel chapter 2 verse 4 all the way up to Daniel chapter 7 verse 28, that entire portion is not written in the Hebrew language. It's again written in the Aramaic language. And again, there's a significance over there because in those, uh, in those passages, you have Nebuchadnezzar describing his dreams. And Daniel is given um, understanding, divine understanding by the Holy Spirit to be able to interpret those dreams correctly. So in those dreams, world events are being talked about. Things which are going to take place in the future are being discussed. In some of those, you know, in, the, in chapter 6, chapter 7, it, there are dreams which are described which talk about the Greek nation which is going to come in the future, the Romans who are going to come in the future. These are all world events which are prophesied in these, um, you know, in, in, these, uh, in this portion. So again, this portion is recorded in the Aramaic language so that the people of even the other nations can read these prophecies and understand what God is planning for the future. So um, this is another significant portion which we see recorded in a different language. And then you have one uh, single verse in Jeremiah, which is written in the Aramaic language. The entire book of Jeremiah is written in the Hebrew language, except for this one verse. God wanted everyone to be able to read this one verse, you know, um, even in their Aramaic language. And that, uh, so that, that would be Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 11. If someone could read out that for us, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 11. Yes, if you were to look at the context of that particular verse, in the earlier verse, in verse um, 10, it talks about how the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. And when he is angry, the earth trembles. And then it goes on to you know, uh, say in verse 11, which we have read out, that all the other gods, you know, they are not the ones who made the heavens and the earth. And... Um, so it is the living God who is in charge, who is in control. And in fact, the next verse, verse 12, it goes on to say, but God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. And so when this sovereignty and power of the living God is being discussed, you have this particular verse, Jeremiah 10, 11, being stated in the Aramaic language, and it declares and says that all the other gods, they are not the ones who have made the heavens and the earth. Um, and it says these gods will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. It's an open declaration to all the nations which, you know, which were speaking Aramaic in those days, declaring and saying that the God of the Israelites, he is the living God. So you have these uh, three portions specifically written in a, in a language which was in use by all the nations in those days. It's something similar to the use of uh, English and French by the nations nowadays. If you look at the world today, in most of the nations, the common language which is used you know, for business transactions, for uh, political you know, interactions, it's either English or it is French. Uh, so you have many other languages which people have, you know, consider their own mother tongue. But the common languages which are used for transactions and interactions and, you know, for uh, 
um, conferences, it's you know generally either English or French. So in the same way, Aramaic at those in those times was considered a universal, uh, well-known language. And the Lord saw to it that these portions of the Old Testament scripture were written in that language so that everyone can read it and know who is the living true God and the power that he holds and the fact that nothing is impossible to him. Now, this has significance for us today in our current setting. We are beginning to enter into times where there is clear opposition to the church of God. It, it may happen uh, to us here in our nation at the national level. But even when you look at the international scenario, we are clearly seeing that powerful forces coming together, entire uh, nations coming together to take a stand against God and his purposes. So these scriptures, you know, which we were just reflecting upon, they are so applicable. If at any time you feel, you know, worried about where we Christians are headed, what's going to be our future, what's going to happen to us, how will the church manage? If we are concerned about these matters, then maybe we could actually look at these Aramaic passages because these are declarations of the living God to all the world saying, this is who I am and this is what my power is. I can do what I wish because I am the only living God. So we can have this deep assurance that we are under the covering of the Almighty One who already knows all the future events that are going to take place. So even as you have certain nations coming together now and you know having talks and taking decisions about whom they are going to attack and whom they are going to bring down, we do not need to be worried because our Almighty God already knows the future, already knows the plans which these nations are making, and He knows how to take his church forward. So whether it's at the international level or whether it is in our nation here in, 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 in India at the national level, the Lord is in charge and the Lord knows how to take care of his own. Um, so if, if someone here online um, asked for you know um, the references, so the first reference, Aramaic reference, is just the name of a place, Genesis 31, 47, not important at all. But then the other three passages are important. Ezra 4.18 all the way up to 6.18. That is um, talking about the decrease of the Persian king, you know, when he tries to stop the construction work of the temple and then again when it restarts. The next reference is Daniel chapter 2 verse 4 all the way up to Daniel 7.28 where you have the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar being described. And God uses those dreams to talk about future world events, about future world powers that are going to come. And then you have that one verse in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 10, 11, where the Lord declares and says that these other gods, which the nations say are gods, will perish. They, you know, they have, they, they have no power whatsoever. Uh, so yes, those are the references. Um, yeah. All right. Um, from there, we will move into the into maybe a um, brief reflection on the Hebrew Old Testament. The Hebrew Old Testament uh, differs a little bit from the New Test from the Old Testament that we find in our uh, English Bibles. Uh, in the sense, the arrangement of the books, the order in which the books are placed, it differs. When um, people in the you know, 1100s, 1200s and all, when they were arranging the um, the Bible into a certain order, you know, putting placing the book, the biblical books in a certain order, they had certain criteria in mind. Um, they wanted the early events to all be placed in one place. So you had, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus and all of those being placed in the in the beginning. And then they moved into the historical books. They saw to it that all the historical books are gathered together one after another in one place. And then lastly, uh, they you know, re reserved that for the prophetic books. So that because the prophecies would be about future events. And so they wanted all of those prophetic books to be placed uh, together in one uh, uh, section. So when we look at the way the 
Old Testament is arranged in our modern Bibles, they had a kind of chronological arrangement in mind. But then, if you look at the uh, you know the Hebrew Old Testament of the Jewish people, the arrangement of the books is slightly different, and they had their own criteria and their own purposes in mind in arranging the Old Testament in that particular order. There's something that we can learn from you know the, those uh, things. So let's just look into that. Um, if you look at the Hebrew Old Testament, we see that there were three main sections. In fact, uh, you know, those of you who are familiar with this will probably even know the terms. They had the name for each of the three main sections. What word do you think was the name of the first section? Because that is something very familiar. Most of us kind of know that. It begins with the word, uh, with the alphabet T. The first section of the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, Torah. Exactly, yes. Uh, we got answers from everywhere, uh, online and here. Uh, yeah. Torah, you know, that is referring to your uh, first five books of the Old Testament. Um, most of it written by Moses. Of course, later generations would have edited it and, you know, um, refined it while they're bringing it together as one collection. So all of that editing work would have gone on, but um, most of it was written uh, by Moses. Uh, so that would be the Torah. The first five books are the Torah. And it's the same whether you're looking at the Hebrew Old Testament or whether you're looking at our modern Bible, that, is, that remains the same. But for them, in their Hebrew Old Testament, the second section, that was called the um, Nevi'im, N-E-V-I-I-M. The word Nevi basically refers to prophets. So they had the prophetic books as their second section. N-E-V-I-I-M, Nevi'im, uh, the prophets. That was the name of the second section. And then you had the third section in the Hebrew Old Testament, which was just generally called Ketuvim, K-E-T-U-V-I-M. And the word K uh, Ketuvim just literally means writings. It's a very general term. It's talking about poetic writings, it's talking about some historical writings, it's talking about uh, writings of different categories. So this Ketuvim was again divided into three portions, and that is kind of um, interesting to know about, uh, because we can learn some things from that. Okay, So the reason that we are in fact talking about this at all is because we can gain some learnings from this. So you have the Torah, the first portion, you have the second portion, which is the prophets, the Nevi'im, and the third portion is the Ketuvim, the writings, the general writings. You have poetic writings, you have historical writings, writings of different categories. In the Ketuvim, there is a subdivision into three categories. So the you first have um, Job's, Psalms, and Proverbs. Yeah, right. Okay, to put it in the correct order, Psalms comes first, then Proverbs, then Job. So in the Ketuvim, the first section is the poetic, you know, three of the poetic books, Psalms, Proverbs, Job. And then at the very end, the last section is again, there are three groupings. You have Daniel, and then you have Ezra and Nehemiah as one writing. And then you have Chronicles, both first and second, as one single writing. So in this third section, the Ketuvim, you have three poetic books in the beginning, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. And then the last three are basically your Daniel, then you have Ezra, Nehemiah, and then you have Chronicles. In the middle, that second section over there, that is called the five Megaloth, M-E-G-I-L-L-O-T. Or that word Megaloth just basically means scrolls, the five scrolls. So these five scrolls were considered very, very important. And in fact, they were read out in the Jerusalem temple on certain special festival days. And they, con they held much significance for the people. So these five scrolls were read out aloud in front of all the people on five different festival days. So let's just look at, you know, spend a little more time dwelling upon that. 
because there is some spiritual significance that we can draw from this public reading that was done of these five different megaloth, these five different scrolls. The first scroll, the first megaloth, was basically the Song of Songs. You know, in our uh, modern day culture, we kind of sideline uh, Song of Songs. We hardly even refer to it. But in the um, Jewish community, during the Passover festival, they would actually read out the entire Song of Songs, you know, while all the congregation is gathered over there and people are listening. Um, the, it, uh, you would have uh, one of the leaders standing over there and reading out this entire Song of Songs. Why did they choose to read out the Song of Songs during the Passover festival? What was the significance? In their minds, what exactly was the Passover? The Passover referred to the time when, you know, the, when the Lord delivered his people from Egypt. God said that if you apply the blood of the Passover lamb on your door, then the angel of death will not enter your door and harm your family. The angel of death will not harm the firstborn in your home, but rather the angel of death will pass over your home. Your home will be left untouched, protected, because it is covered by the blood of the Passover lamb. And so for them, it was a special, um, a special uh, favor which the living God showed them and then after that, you know, after that event, uh, the Pharaoh, in fact, allows them to leave. So this Passover festival was very, very significant. And on this very, very significant festival day, when they would be thinking and reflecting upon what God did for them, where he protected and shielded their homes from the angel of death. On that day, even as they're reflecting upon what God did for them as a nation, they would choose to stand over there and meditate upon Song of Songs while it is being read out. Because Song of Songs is basically talking about a covenant relationship. Now, if you look at the Song of Songs, it's basically talking about the covenant between a man and a woman. So it's referring more to a, a marriage relationship. But the Jewish people understood that this covenant relationship is also reflecting the relationship which God has chosen to adopt with his people. So the Song of Songs, in the Song of Songs, the focus is mainly on the um, covenant relationship between one man and one woman. But the Jewish people as a nation also saw themselves in a covenant relationship with the living God. And in fact, in Isaiah and in a few other places, God specifically refers to himself as their husband. So they were aware of this. And so they would stand over there during the Passover festival and read out about the faithfulness of God and the devotion and dedication that he has towards his people, whom he considers his, you know, his wife, whom he considers his bride. So with a very reverential attitude, they would reflect upon how the all-powerful sovereign God has chosen to humble himself and take a human people, I mean, people who are not even perfect. In fact, people who spent most of their lives in sin, if you look at the Israelite history, they were not a very faithful nation. But the Almighty God chose to take somebody like that and make uh, them his wife, his bride. Because if you look at the Song of Songs, it talks about the king who chooses an unknown Shunammite woman as his bride. The Shunammite, she was somebody who worked in the fields as a laborer. She was nobody important. And the king chooses someone like her to be his bride. So they understood what God did for them in that event of Passover when he chose to show love to a people who were not really worthy of it. And um, so they chose to read this particular scroll, the scroll of the Song of Songs, on the festival of the Passover. Now, when we look at this from our New Testament times, it adds another layer to it. Because back then, you know, in, the, in, um, in those days, uh, the Jewish people uh, didn't really uh, know what else, what, uh, what 
what greater significance the passover festival would be holding in the future now we who are in the new testament times can understand to a greater extent the significance of the passover passover feast because when jesus came he chose to become that passover lamb to save us in the original passover feast it was just the blood of uh, you know goats and sheep that was used uh, a lamb the sheer the blood of a lamb that was used but then this god of gods the almighty one is willing to enter into a covenant relationship with sinful human beings and he is willing to shed his blood for them so when we look at the passover feast you know from the eyes of the new testament reader it achieves so much more significance so if you if you look at the song of songs now in the context of the new testament times you realize that this king not only did he just choose a insignificant shunamite woman he was willing to die for this insignificant shunamite woman so that he can have a covenant relationship with her i mean it 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 kind of you know brings out the beauty and in fact the greatness of the love which the almighty god has for people you know who are not even perfect imperfect people and his love towards us is that great uh, so it adds a um, new significance to the passover feast it also adds new significance to the book of the song of songs moving very quickly to the next um, megaloth then the next scroll which was read out uh, in those days um the book of ruth is the next megaloth so this scroll of ruth was read out uh, during the feast of pentecost now um, that word pentecost back then in old testament times it just basically referred to the uh, the 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 week in which the um, wheat harvest would be done so you know you had this agricultural seasons so at the end of each agricultural season they would have a feast so at the 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 word pentecost is basically referring to that i think it refers to the 50th week or the 5th week or something i don't really remember the 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 meaning of the word pentecost but it's talking about the end of the wheat harvest and so at that time the book of ruth was read out simply because um of the connection between the wheat harvest and the story of ruth because that is basically when ruth comes to uh, you know comes to israel right uh, and um, uh, she goes into the fields to pick up whatever you know grain is left over after all the uh, you know laborers have gathered in the harvest so uh, she is an outsider who's coming over there and this rich harvest which is being harvested and you know gathered into the barns and she an outsider is able to at least get her hands on some of it so even outsiders were allowed to come to the field and pick a little bit of the grain um even though they are not part of the actual israelite community so in that sense the feast of pentecost signified the fact that god is providing lavishly for his people but even outsiders are welcome if they choose to come and join and want to partake of what yahweh is offering so with that significance in mind they would read out uh, the book of ruth during the feast of the pentecost now when we look at this feast from our new testament eyes you immediately have another layer being added to this because we in new testament times immediately identify the pentecost with the event where the holy spirit comes upon the people and on that first you know um, event of um, the new testament pentecost uh, it's not only uh, the people who are in the upper room you know who are uh, you know baptized in the holy spirit but you also have um, people of different nations coming over there to listen to peter preaching and it in fact says that uh, 3000 persons were added you know to the kingdom of god that day so it's talking about a spiritual harvest which took place on that day of pentecost if you look at the old testament they are just thinking in terms of the wheat harvest and they are think thinking in terms of outsiders like ruth who came in 
and were able to partake of this harvest. But now when we look at the feast from the New Testament perspective, there's so much greater significance. Um, maybe we can read one particular scripture uh, which can make us reflect more on the spiritual significance of this. Uh, that would be Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. If we could have someone read out for us, Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, please. It talks about a New Testament event where the Holy Spirit starts gathering the wheat into his barn. He's gathering his people into his kingdom. And so in the Old Testament Feast of Pentecost, you only had physical wheat being gathered in. But when you look at the New Testament Pentecost, there are people who have responded to, the Je to Jesus and who have placed their faith in him. They are being gathered into the Lord's barn, into his kingdom through the Holy Spirit. So it's such a, and it's not just some people like Ruth who chose to come to the nation of Israel and physically live over there who have benefited. Today you can live in a live in another country and never ever visit Jerusalem. But today even you can be part of the kingdom of God. So the the spiritual significance is expanded in the New Testament times. So. Now you don't have to be like Ruth to literally go and live over there to come under the protection of Yahweh. You can be anywhere in the world or the Holy Spirit who has seen your heart and the belief that you have placed in Jesus, he will gather you into his barn. Okay, so Pentecost has a much greater significance in our um, you know, New Testament times. Coming to the other um, three uh, scrolls, uh, the book of Lamentations was read out on the day of atonement because on that day you know atonement was done for the sins of the people so the people would read out the book of lamentations and confess their sins they would admit their sinfulness and they would receive the forgiveness which god is offering them so the book of lamentations was the third scroll the third megaloth which was read out uh, on the day of atonement Coming to the fourth, that was the book of Ecclesiastes. And this was read out at the end of the fruit harvest. Um, that would be the festival of tabernacles or the feast of booths. You know, depending on which uh, version you're looking at, it's either called feast of booths or the feast of tents or the feast of tabernacles. On that day, um, Ecclesiastes was read out simply because, you know, it's the end of the fruit harvest. And it's a time of rejoicing. And Ecclesiastes talks about how God has called us to enjoy the life that you know, he is offering us. Ecclesiastes 8.15. It says, so I, Ecclesiastes 8.15. It says, so I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their uh, toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. So it's just a uh, Ecclesiastes is read out because it talks about the life that God has given us, and when we live it according to His, um, you know, uh, according to His laws and according to His will, He will be there to help us. Um, and finally, the last scroll was the book of Esther, and that was read out during the feast of Purim. Because the Feast of Purim is the feast which um, reminds the people of how God saved them from, Na from Haman you know, and from uh, uh, the, the large-scale massacre which he wanted to release upon the people. And the people were spared from that. So Esther was read out during the Feast of Purim. So these five Megaloth were placed in the Ketuvim section of the Old Testament as a reminder 
of five different aspects, five different ways in which God interacts with his people. Okay, so even as we look at these five books, we can, you know, ask ourselves, what in what way did God interact with his people in this book? And how would that apply to me in the way God interacts with me today? Okay, so just as a kind of homework, if you have, you know, when, when we have time later, look at those five megaloth, ask yourself, in what way did God interact with the people in these five books? And what significance can that have for me today? In, in, you know, in, in the sense, how does God interact with me? And how do those same spiritual up, uh, principles apply to me today? So, um, yeah. Um, so, if you look at the Hebrew Old Testament, it begins, of course, with the book of Genesis. And like we said, the last book which they had in their arrangement, what is the very last book in their arrangement of the Old Testament? If someone can say it loudly. Huh? That is our uh, modern uh, Bible. But then in the Hebrew Old Testament, you know, in the, uh, okay, the, uh, in, the, in the Ketuvim section, the first three books was Psalms, Proverbs, Job. The very last three were, um, you had Daniel, followed by Ezra, Nehemiah, and then you had Chronicles. Chronicles. Yes. yes. And then in the middle, you had the five megaloth. So, which is why when you come to um, the New Testament and Jesus referring to the Old Testament scriptures, this is what he says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. If someone can very quickly read out for that, uh, read, read out that verse for us. Matthew 23, verse 35. Ah, uh, see, we, the bell went off. If, yeah, if you can just quickly read out Matthew 23, verse 35. The blood of righteous Abel uh, was shed in the book of Genesis, the first book. The blood of Zechariah was shed in the in one of the Chronicles passages, which you know in their uh, Old Testament was the last book. So basically, over here, Jesus is referring to the uh, Hebrew arrangement of the Old Testament books, and he says, right from the first book up to the last book, it was always the righteous who were attacked. Their blood was shed because your leaders are hypocrites who do not want to hear the truth. So in that one single verse, he in fact refers to the Hebrew arrangement of the Old Testament books. So yeah, we are out of time. Uh, if we can just close with a small word of prayer, all right? If we can just close our eyes. Lord, we thank you for the things that we uh, reflected upon in our class today. We pray, oh Lord, that even as we spend some time uh, dwelling upon this, uh, this lesson later, you would bring more spiritual truths to us, oh Lord so that we can uh, draw closer to you through our study of the Old Testament. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you.